the Palestinian issue and a vote on Palestinian statehood at the UN General Assembly this month continues to be the likely front burner issue at this year's general debate, which we'll hear from President Obama starting on September 21st. Peace talks between Israel and Palestine have stalled, and the decision to put the statehood bid to a vote with all its implications, including a possible cutoff of international aid, appears to be set to take place. The situation in the Middle East is volatile, and an attack on the Israeli embassy in Egypt has raised tensions. And another issue that looms large in the Middle East is a nuclear Iran. We are here to discuss the implications of a Palestinian bid for statehood and the threats to peace in the Middle East with Israel's UN Ambassador Ron Prosser. Ambassador Prosser, Israel's UN Ambassador, considered one of the most senior and experienced diplomats in Israel, is a former Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He was a member of the Israeli delegation to the Y Plantation Peace Talks in Maryland in 1998. He has served in London and Bonn and in the Israeli Embassy in Washington, D.C. I'm Pamela Falk for CBS News at the United Nations. Welcome, Ambassador Prosser. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Would you please tell us what the implications are of a Palestinian bid for statehood? Needless to say, it would not go to the or it might go to the Security Council, but wouldn't pass. But a vote at the General Assembly, what are the implications? I think the most important thing to really uh, make clear to everyone, and you mentioned the fact that I was part of the Israeli delegation to both Y at the Camp David, is that there's no shortcuts to peace. A, we should be going back to direct negotiations. Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu stated that there's no circumventing that because uh, unilateral actions on both sides, and this is what the Palestinians are trying to do now, can only lead to, not it won't lead to peace, it will lead to potentially more violence in the region. Why? Because the Palestinians, instead of running all over the world, have a 15-minute drive from Ramallah to Jerusalem. Instead of running around the world, they all, have, they, all they have to do is go over to Jerusalem and continue in, in direct negotiations and not talk to the UN, uh, but talk uh, to us directly. They're trying to talk over us and not to us. We should go back to direct negotiations because unilateral actions, especially after we signed the Oslo agreements and the interim agreements, are a violation of all those agreements and approximately 40 spheres of cooperation that we have with the Palestinians on all dimensions and all facets. So the bottom line of what I'm saying is, let's get back into negotiations. There are no shortcuts here. And the only way forward is in direct dialogue, not a monologue. Now, some have called uh, a vote at the UN ruinous. Others have said it's dangerous. Uh, and others have said it's a death knell for the peace process. Some have suggested putting on the peace process, and that might change the course of the vote. Is there any chance this vote won't take place? Look, we're trying as we speak. You know that uh, Ashton is up in, uh, in Cairo. And we're trying to get uh, to direct negotiations up to the last minute. I think that's the best option. Like I said, unilateral actions and what the Palestinians are trying to do, I think one could say that it's bad for, the, for peace, it's bad for the region, and it's bad for their own quest to reach a serious uh, situation with statehood. Because it does exactly the opposite. Uh, take an example of South Sudan. We all saw here at the United Nations, we were all emotionally taken by South Sudan being the 193 state. How did they do it? Sweat, hard work, sleepless nights, sitting with North Sudan every day. Do they like each other? No. Is it hard? Yes. Have they a history between each other? Yes. But they sat down, did what they had to do, and only then came afterwards to the United Nations. Abbas is coming to the United Nations and declaring unilateral statehood about what? Is it Abbas or is it Hamas? It's the only guy I know who's uh, 
is the president of an authority that has zero authority on what's going on in Gaza. So he comes around without even having the authority and control of Gaza where Israeli citizens are being bombarded with missiles day in and day out. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that if rockets fall on your head, you're allowed to defend yourself. So and is th there, are there any discussions with Hamas? No, I mean, what can we discuss with an organization which is a terrorist organization that basically says, and I want really people to understand, what are they saying? They don't think Israel has a right to exist. They say it, they repeat it. So what can we discuss? What flowers to order for our own funeral? How deep the hole? How big the coffin? We have to sit down with the Palestinian Authority in the direct negotiations in order to really try and bridge the problems. Is it, is it hard? Yes. Like I said, it's not easy. That's why it takes so long. But there's no other way around that. That's the only way forward. And anyone who tries to do something different will only lead to violence and additional frustrations in a reg region which is volatile anyhow. Now, you speak to all the diplomats here. You're here at the UN. What, where does the, United, the European Union stand, for example, on this? They seem to have had different opinions and held out to the last minute on a statehood vote. Well, you know, the Europeans, 27 countries, they're divided also on this. But I think the most important thing that everyone can do, the world can do, is tell the Palestinians, we're not against you. But what we're telling you is the only way forward for sustainable peace is through direct negotiations. Don't try and talk to us or over us through the UN. Don't try to impose something from the outside because it won't work. It's hard work and it's not easy, but that's the only way forward. And if this vote goes forward, separating out the issues of reactions to it, cut off of aid, what is, explain what is dangerous about the unilateral action. Well, the unilateral action, like I said, is a breach of every agreement that we have with the Palestinians. The Oslo agreements, the interim agreements of 1995, the custom agreements. What does it basically tell an Israeli? When we sign peace agreements, we did that with Egypt, we did that with Jordan, we give tangibles, we get in return a piece of paper and agreement, which we take very, very seriously. Same thing with the Yasser Arafat and the Oslo Agreement with the Palestinian Authority. If Israeli citizens feel that they give tangibles, at the end of the day they receive a breach of those agreements, we will be looking at this in a completely different way. And this is not something which is positive to anything which is constructive for peace. We need to sit down together in direct negotiations and there's it, we can't do it a day later. We have to do it now. Let's go back to direct negotiations and not go around uh, giving statements that are basically a march of folly. It's fantasy. It won't change anything on the ground. But the symbolics will create a, a deterioration in a region which is volatile anyhow. All right, so now to the peace plans. Is there a way that the Middle East Quartet, the U.S., the U.N., Europe, uh, the European Union, and Russia could propose something, and, and they did make a new statement, uh, which has 1967 lines and land swaps and the recognition of Israel as a Jewish state uh, that would avert this vote? I think uh, we shouldn't be focusing just on the vote. We should be trying to focus on how do we achieve a comprehensive peace in the region. And that means putting all the most sensitive issues on the table. Prime Minister Netanyahu calls for resumption of direct negotiations tomorrow morning. We negotiated with the Palestinians for, for a very long time on the most sensitive issues without them climbing up on a tree and saying, we will only return to, to negotiations if you do this or if you do that you stop settlements. If, this is something which is completely new. And for two years, Mahmoud Abbas has used every opportunity he could in order to run away from direct negotiations. So I think the most important thing the international community could tell the Palestinians is go back to direct negotiations. You won't receive additional 
freebies by being outside and trying to uh, wiggle something, uh, some tangibles for you to return to the negotiation table. I'll say it differently. Look what's happening. The whole world, Israel, is in parentheses begging the Palestinians to go back to direct negotiations, which should be the only way, constructive way, for them to achieve a state which everyone is for. So let's get back to the table. The important thing from our point of view is for them to realize that uh, this is not just a two-state solution. It's two states for two people. And by the way, if you hear any Palestinian leader say two states for two people, please phone me even at 12 o'clock at night or phone a 911 number. Because uh, we want to know that a two-state solution is not, uh, in their words, a two-stage solution for the annihilation of the state of Israel as a Jewish state or as the nation state of the Jewish people. Now, uh, the New York Times, for example, in an editorial board this past weekend, um, an editorial said uh, that the U.S. and the quartet should offer him something. And you've said he's been offered, Abbas, this is, uh, many different things. But uh, what, what they said was the Obama administration offer was listless, was the word they used. Do you think the Obama administration and the UN ambassador, the efforts have been enough to try to get the Palestinians to the negotiating table so that there is, uh, so this vote would be averted? I think the United States worldwide is doing an amazing job. It's many times the United States, the United States administration, and more than that, the American people do not receive credit for. Not just on Palestine, but if you look at other parts in the world, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, you know, there's a time for part uh, of this world to stand up and say thank you. Thank you to the United States for allocating the resources, the manpower, and for caring for what's happening in the world. So instead of, you know, criticizing, I think uh, there's a lot that the United States is doing and uh, without the United States, we wouldn't be where we are now. And I think the most important thing is now to get both sides to understand that you can't get more and more by sitting down and not doing anything. Uh, it's time to go back to direct negotiations. You won't get any more tangibles by sitting out and trying to pressure everyone to, uh, to go back to uh, unilateral actions, which at the end of the day, and many Palestinians say that, they themselves know it's not constructive for their cause and for the region in achieving a serious statehood for the Palestinians. Well, on that note, there was a survey, and there seems to be differences between the Prime Minister and the President of Palest uh, the Palestinian Authority about whether the vote would be good. Uh, has there been any effort to, to persuade the Palestinians not to go ahead with the vote by Israel? There's an internal mm -hmm. debate. Uh, the Prime Minister Salam Fayyad, who is right. indulging in the nation-building process, knows, for example, that the West Bank, in parentheses, it's the only bank that I know today that can show a 10% growth in economics uh, in what's happening. And why is it happening? That cooperation in the West Bank is because of the cooperation between Israel and the Palestinians, security cooperation, economic cooperation, which shows if one works together, you can see, you know, the, the tangibles happening on the ground. So there's the internal discussions on the Palestinian side, but sometimes the symbolics go beyond what I think is smart and reasonable. And uh, one should go back to what really makes a difference. And what makes a difference are direct negotiations, no shortcuts no circumvention of anything, uh, because that would achieve the contrary to, uh, to peace, but uh, more violence in the region. All right, and I'd like to turn to the bigger picture of the Arab Spring and its effect on Israel, but very short term, where do you, where do you see this going? Are you hopeful that there may not be this vote at the UN, it's a week away, or do you think it's full steam ahead? Well, I'm hopeful we hope for the best, and the best in this case is going back to the table and not uh, doing something 
at the UN. I think the best thing is seeking for solutions, not resolutions. Yeah. Uh, solution is, uh, is hard work. Resolutions are trying to do something which uh, has, you know, media effects, shorthand. It won't really create any differences on the ground. Uh, but we have to focus on that, what I think uh, we should try and do until the last moment. So you're still hopeful? Absolutely hopeful. All right, let me turn to a more uh, uh, dreary and maybe uh, threatening question, and that is Iran. Uh, the, in Vienna, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, said today they're still concerned about a nuclear Iran, which obviously presents some kind of a threat to Israel. How do you see the Iran threat? Thank you for asking that, because with everything that is happening, the most important thing, and it's not under the radar screen, it's above the radar screen, it's Iran and Iran's strategic influence on what's happening in the region. This mix of an Ayatollah regime with delivery systems and nuclear weapons is a deadly mix that will have an effect not just on Israel, but the whole, this whole strategic environment in the Middle East and also in what's happening in Europe and in the United States. Iran sits on the potential oil reserves of Western democracies. What was the world going to do when Iran really sits on, you know, on the handle? I mean, with nuclear weapons, with an ideology, Iran is the major sponsor of terrorism it's really with ideology trying to destabilize uh, things in Lebanon, in Egypt, in the whole region, in the, in the Gulf countries. And from my point of view, this is the greatest threat to peace, not just in the Middle East, but in the world. We, the world, have to really unite because we can make a difference, put additional sanctions, make sure that the Ayatollah regime in Iran understand that there's a price tag. If they continue this way, there's a price tag on their behavior. They can really make a difference in what we see now in the region. And uh, if you saw what WikiLeaks said, major leaders in the Middle East have sleepless nights, not over the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but of Iran and its quest for nuclear weapons and the ideology that sponsored terrorism in the region. And so just to bring it to very specific threats, if Iran were to get nuclear weapons and they just launched a new nuclear facility today, uh, what is the direct threat to Israel? Is the, the implication of using those weapons? Of course. I mean, you don't, uh, in the sense, Iran uh, acquires nuclear weapons uh, not just to have them. We cannot uh, sit down idle and uh, think, what if the Iranians? This goes beyond Israel. This is a question which the whole world has to address. Uh, it's something that the whole world should unite and try to really make the point to the Iranians. That's it. Iran should be stopped in any quest of nuclear weapons because they have the ideology, they sponsor terrorism, and they are the main force behind any destabilizing issues in the Middle East, pushing extremism, fundamentalism, and really radical Islamism in a region that uh, that's the last thing that it needs. Well, thank you, Ambassador Prosser. We look forward to following up after the General Assembly about the vote, about Egypt and Israel and all of the threats to peace and, and seeing where they go from here. So I would like to thank you. Thank you, and it was a pleasure being with you, and I'll come again. Absolutely. We would love to have you. Thank and you. I'm Pamela Falk for CBS News at UN Headquarters.